Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming along to another evening of the WAPA Wellbeing Education Evenings. Uh, tonight we talk about a very important uh, condition on kidney disease and of course we're born with two kidneys. Some are unlucky to have one. There's a world out there that wants to buy them, they smuggle them, they kidnap people to get their kidneys. So a kidney is a very important part of our body. Um, we have three very Good speakers this evening, as always, we try to cover a number of the issues that arise with any disease. We have Professor Carol Pol uh, Pollock, who's a specialist in renal medicine, renal being the kidney. We have Stephanie Notaris, who's a renal dietitian. And we have Hannah Burgess, a social worker, involved in some of the psychosocial -so issues that happen in kidney disease. <coughs> For all of you who've come along, there's a big chart that Kidney Health has uh, provided us with tonight. And of course that shows that approximately 1.7 million people may be affected by kidney disease. For those of us over the age of 60, and there are just a couple in the audience, uh, that's one of the factors that might be, hello. Okay, we'll have uh, Dan from Kidney Health will come along as well and have a talk about some of the things that Kidney Health do for us. Um, some of the risk factors for us, diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, and being over the age of 60. So that brings in a lot of other conditions that may affect your kidney. And with quite a number of diseases of our body, unfortunately, these things creep up on us and we don't find out and often it, when it's too late. And for some people, they may have to go on to dialysis, which is a serious form of therapy. But in this country, thankfully, it's probably a cheaper option than many other countries. Uh, as we have uh, some wonderful speakers tonight, I just want to remind you to please turn off or put your phones on silent, would appreciate it. And most of you know that we have a Q&A at the end where we'll invite our guest speakers to sit up here as a panel and we'll ask some questions and try and answer some of those questions for you. So without further ado, I'm going to in, well, introduce Dan, I think, who'd just like to have a quick word about Kidney Australia, and then we will take that back, Kidney Health Australia, and then we'll go on to our guest speakers. Thank you, Dan. Well, a, uh, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for coming along tonight. Uh, it's a very, very important topic, and a lot of people don't know much about their kidneys. Um, I'm from Kidney Health Australia. I'm going to take a few minutes just to let you know what we do as an organisation. Uh, one of my roles is to go out to the community and do talks like this. And it's quite astonishing how many people actually don't know about their kidneys. They don't know what they do, they don't know how to look after them, and they don't know what happens when your kidneys fail. So tonight's really, really important. You can hear some really interesting information. And if you have any questions, if you want to get some advice or uh, have a chat to somebody that can offer some of that advice, uh, we're the people that you can give a call to. So uh, Kidney Health Australia is a non-for-profit organisation. Uh, this is some of the programs and services we have available. I'm um, not going to talk about all of them tonight. I've only got a couple of minutes of your time tonight. But if you do hear about something tonight and you'd like some more information, absolutely give us a call. Uh, we have telephone services that are staffed by renal nurses. Uh, if you've got diabetes, high blood pressure, or over the age of 60, make sure you give us a call. We can provide you with lots of different information. This is just a little bit of information about us. Uh, we're a non-for-profit organisation. Uh, we're the peak organisation in Australia for kidney-related disease. Uh, we've got offices all the way across the country, and uh, we've been around since 1968. So we're a quite a large organisation and uh, we definitely have a lot of programs and services in place to let the general public know about kidney disease. Here we go. Uh, so one of our great services we have available is the 1800 line. The number is 1800 for kidney, and this is the go-to place for anything kidney related. Every year we send out about 500,000 pieces of information. We take about 1,000 calls a month. It uh, can be anything from a newly diagnosed patient, um, a patient that wants to travel overseas, access superannuation. Uh, we get lots of calls from diabetics and patients with high blood pressure, um, asking about healthy recipes or way that they can control their blood pressure. Um, anything like that at all, or anything you hear about tonight that you'd like more information on, this is a really great service. Give us a call and we can help steer you in the right direction. We do have a lot of programs and services available to help all, uh, all patients uh, that come across uh, with kidney disease. Um, unfortunately, we do get a lot of kids and young adults with kidney disease, and we have a lot of programs and services in place to look after these young guys and girls that unfortunately get kidney disease. 
Um, we've been running a trial in Sydney at the moment uh, with the 18 to 25 age group. This is a group that um, were on dialysis, getting transplants and then losing them. So we've been doing a lot of work in this area to try and um, raise the importance of staying on medication and ways to look after your kidney if you're lucky enough to get a transplant. We have a fantastic website, so if, uh, if you have access to the internet, type the word kidney into Google. We're the first website that comes up. On our website, there's a plethora of information, everything from questions to ask your doctor, there's a whole suite of healthy recipes, um, lots of ones that are low in sugar and low in salt, so that's quite important. Jump on our website, you can find anything you need on our website there. And the website address is kidney.org.au. We also have a fantastic newsletter. If you uh, saw me out the front there, that's our kidney community newsletter. This is a free newsletter that gets sent out every month. In it is a recipe of the month. Uh, anything that's happening in the world of kidneys, we put into this resource. Uh, there's always new findings, uh, new things going on with local government. It's a, a fantastic resource if you've got any interest at all in kidneys, diabetes, or high blood pressure. Uh, you can subscribe and get it uh, quite regularly. On the second page of the newsletter is the way to do that. Uh, you can give us a call and we can post it out to your mailbox or you can receive it via email. We also have a number of health fact sheets. There's about 30 available. They're translated into 16 different languages as well. Uh, we cover everything from a glossary of terms, uh, questions to ask your doctor, right the way through to supportive care. So again, if you have any questions after tonight, give us a call. We can post these out to you free of charge, or you can access them on the internet as well. We have a number of fantastic resources available. Uh, cooking books, uh, life on kidney disease, patient stories. So uh, if this is something that interests you, jump on our website. You can see a number of the recipe booklets and other booklets that we have available. Uh, we can also post these out to your house as well. Uh, one of our most popular is called Back on the Menu. It's a number of uh, low sugar and low salt recipes. Um, really fantastic recipes that were put together by a number of dietitians. That's it from me. Uh, that's how you can contact us. So um, you can give us a call, one 800 kidney You can jump online and visit us at kidney.org.au. We've also got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. So if you are tech savvy, make sure you jump on and find us. Um, but thank you very much for coming tonight. It's really important that you're here. Hopefully you learned something new. You've got some fantastic speakers, so I hope you really enjoy them. And a big thank you to the Walper for having us support them tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. Our first speaker tonight is Professor Carol Pollock, who is a uh, specialist renal physician. She's professor, professorial chair of Medicine, University of Sydney, Royal North Shore Hospital, and is chairman of the board of the North Sydney Local Health Area. Uh, she's been awarded an ANZ Society of Nephrology Young Investigator Award. She's a highly qualified person and recently was inducted as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. So Carol is going to be talking about what your kidneys do for you and what you can do for your kidneys. Please welcome Professor Pollock. Thanks very much and, uh, and thanks for inviting me to give this, uh, this talk tonight. Um, I was saying before to, um, to some of the, the staff here that the reason why I'm here basically is because my dad was looked after at Walpa Hospital um, some years ago, seven years ago actually, when he was in palliative care and I was so grateful for the care that he got um, that um, it moved me to be very happy to be able to um, talk to all you guys about kidney disease and um, how important it is. And I think um, I'd just like to say it's very good that the, um, that the committee has actually included both Hannah and Stephanie and myself in the program because it illustrates how we actually work together very closely professionally to actually provide very much multidisciplinary care for people with kidney disease because we recognise it affects so much of your um, social circumstances, your broader health issues um, and it's not just about your kidneys, it's about things that are much, much broader than that. It's about your family, um, your work situations. Um, and I think that it, um, it hopefully gives co confidence to people that we all do work together very closely to hopefully ensure that you have a, a good outcome, not just from kidney disease, but from your, um, you know, your overall uh, you know, place in the community, etc. So I look forward to hearing both Stephanie and, uh, and Hannah speaking down the track. 
So yes, I'm, um, I'm also, I should have a disclosure here, I'm a board member of Kidney Health Australia. So um, thanks very much for Dan for espousing everything that Kidney Health Australia do. Um, so um, I think, it, it, you know, as Dan says, people don't actually understand what kidneys do. Kidneys are extremely important and I think there's been a number of people over the years who've said that, um, you know, the kidneys are the most important uh, organ in the body. And I actually agree with that. Some people would uh, take a different view if you're a cardiologist or a, a neurologist, but in fact, um, the kidneys actually have an enormous amount of sensing ability. They sense what goes on in your body and then they act to correct it. Um, and there's not very many organs that actually both sense a problem and correct a problem. But when there is kidney damage, then they either don't sense properly or they don't correct properly and that's when things go wrong. So basically, um, what they do is they control what, um, what is the content of your body fluids and how much body fluid you actually have. And if that's not right, then the things that your kidneys normally do can cause a problem with, for instance, your heart, your bones, um, your blood vessels, various other organs that then get badly affected by the fact that you have kidney disease. So in essence, um, they filter the waste products from um, your blood. Both the kidneys and the liver do both of those jobs um, and both of them do it for different things. Um, but it's important that, um, that people appreciate that there are some, for instance, drugs that only get filtered by the kidney. So if your kidney function isn't 100%, we need to do things like modify the, the drug doses so that there isn't toxicity that can either cause more of a kidney problem or else build up drug levels that can then secondarily affect things like your heart or even your brain. Um, so that it is very important that we are aware of what your kidney function is when we prescribe other, other drugs, including antibiotics and other you know, more common things, um, non-steroidals, Nurofen, those sorts of drugs that a lot of people get over the counter. They also make hormones, and um, part of the hormones are, they make a, a hormone called erythropoietin, which um, many of you might realize is one of the hormones that um, has come into disrepute from the cycling community because it makes you make red blood cells, which of course increase your oxygen carrying capacity and make other organs function. Now, athletes have been unfortunately known to misuse that because it Im increases their oxygen delivery to muscle, etc., and enhances performance. So it's a banned drug in the sports arena. But in people who have kidney problems, years ago, and I've been a kidney specialist for 28 years now, um, we used to have to give people transfusions on a very regular basis because their blood count would drop repeatedly. And this has been an enormous breakthrough to actually be able to give people erythropoietin so that it stimulates what your kidneys would normally do to make um, blood cells that increases your energy capacity, increases your oxygen delivery to other organs and prevents other organ damage, if you like. Um, and also stops all of the complications of having blood transfusions, which thankfully now are very rare. But in the past, 30 years ago, there were a lot of complications, um, particularly with infection related um, to blood transfusions. Kidneys sense what your blood pressure is and, and they do things like decrease hormones that would otherwise put your blood pressure up and they promote salt loss, which is often a cause of high blood pressure. So when your kidneys don't work properly, Often you end up having that sort of sensing system not working properly and you end up with high blood pressure, which is a very key sign um, that you need to have your kidneys checked. A lot of people will have high blood pressure in the community and a lot of people won't have kidney disease. But if you have high blood pressure, it's really important that you get your kidney function checked because kidneys can cause high blood pressure, but conversely, high blood pressure can cause kidney disease. And then of course we get in a downward spiral unless, kidney, uh, unless blood pressure is controlled. Otherwise the kidney function becomes worse, the blood pressure becomes worse, the heart becomes worse and complications arise. Um, maintaining salt balance is, um, is something that is also important for blood pressure but also for heart failure. So often people who have kidney disease will end up with having an expanded um, amount of salt and water in their system which puts a strain on the heart and the heart can end up failing. So people who have 
a, a, a propensity to heart failure. If you've also got kidney problems, the two make each other worse and there's a very well recognised syndrome called cardiorenal syndrome which says if you've got heart problems it causes kidney problems, if you've got kidney problems it causes heart problems. Um, then these things are very important. Potassium, because if your potassium isn't normal it causes heart problems. Um, calcium and phosphate because that will cause bone problems and there's a very well recognised um, uh, disorder now called um, uh, cardiac and metabolic and vascular bone disorder. Um, and vi vitamin D as well because what happens you get vitamin D I think people recognise from the sun but for it, vitamin D to work it needs to be acted upon by the liver and then be acted upon by the kidney for you to get active vitamin D. So you will often find people with kidney disease will need to take active vitamin D to stop them from developing problems with, um, with their bones. So we have about a million filtering units in the kidney it, and the filtering units are largely blood vessels and they filter the blood now um, and then retain what we need to retain, get rid of what we need to get rid of. So if we put all of the blood vessels in the kidney um, and laid them out flat, it would by far and away be in excess of what would cover a tennis court. So there's a lot of these um, you know, small uh, cells that involve filtration um, in the kidney. So you can imagine anything that affects uh, the heart and blood vessels also affects the kidneys. Now the kidney filters about 180 litres of water a day of urine. Most of the work in the kidney is actually in reabsorbing that 180 litres and in fact one of the early signs of kidney disease is that you pass more urine rather than less because I'm always saying to people you've got kidney problems um, and they say I couldn't I pass a lot of urine but passing a lot of urine is a sign the kidneys aren't appropriately reabsorbing 180 odd litres and most of us pass about a litre a day it's very hard to realise you know do I pass more urine than you or whoever so one of the early signs of kidney disease in children is that they wet the bed um, and in adults they get up at night to pass urine. Now there's a lot of other reasons why people get up at night to pass urine and I give talks to medical students and I always end up with 20 emails at the end of the lecture saying I get up at night to pass urine. It doesn't always mean that they've got kidney disease but it is something that you know doctors will alert to thinking well that could be a problem. We also filter about 4.2 kilos of salt a day and most of the work of the kidney is in regulating um, the reabsorption of the majority of that salt. But you can imagine you only need to be out by about 1% and that means that it precipitates high blood pressure or indeed dehydration. So people with kidney problems are more prone to dehydration and therefore dehydration can precipitate more of a kidney problem. So we tell people with kidney disease you've got to very much worry if you get diarrhoea, vomiting, because your kidneys won't be able to do what they normally do and protect you from um, having low blood pressure and getting dehydrated. Um, so when the filtering aspect is reduced, that's when you get a reduction um, in your um, glomerular filtration rate. You might, people who have kidney problems are aware of what their EGFR is, can be interpreted as a percentage of kidney function. Um, and, uh, and that can decline with age, which is normal. Uh, you know, so everybody declines at about 10% per decade. Your knees aren't as good when you are, you know, when you're 70 as what they are when you're 20. Your kidneys aren't as good as, you know, when you're 70 as what they are when you're 20. So having a reduction in EGFR per se doesn't mean that you're going to develop kidney failure, but it does mean for your doctors that they just need to watch what sort of medications and in what dose you might need to be prescribed various drugs and also whether or not there's other types of um, things that you might need to be wary of, um, things like Stephanie's going to talk about in terms of uh, diet, etc. So this is just the anatomy of the kidneys. I think everybody's sort of aware of what a kidney looks like because people see them in a butcher shop. Can't bring myself to eat a kidney. Um, but the blood enters through the artery and then goes into these very small blood vessels and then that the very small blood vessels is what does the filtering. Then they coalesce into the veins and then eventually into the renal artery. 
Now, these very small blood vessels that do the filtering is what makes the urine, and the urine comes out and passes in through the ureter. So problems with the kidney can either happen with the artery being narrowed or blocked, and so the kidney doesn't get enough circulation. It can happen if the vein's blocked and then there's congestion in the kidney, that's a problem. Or it can happen in the, um, in the ureter, and that causes back pressure on the kidney and almost stops filtration because of the back pressure. And probably in males, the commonest cause of that is a prostate problem. So if somebody um, who's a male presents with symptoms of prostate problems and kidney impairment, most people would have an ultrasound to make sure there wasn't evidence of back pressure on the kidney that might limit the, um, the normal function of the kidney because of this back pressure that stops filtration. So as Daniel said, there's um, the kidneys sort of like anything really, uh, they're only going to give you a warning sign if something goes wrong very quickly. So if you've got normal kidney function and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, your kidney function um, becomes acutely abnormal, so that's called acute renal failure, you'll feel dreadful. But if your kidney function has been slowly declining over years and years, you know, you decline by about 2% per year, 3% per year, you don't notice day to day, year by year, that you're actually feeling worse. And so often people are surprised when we say, well, you've only got 20% of your kidney function. They tell me they're passing urine, they say they feel fine, and yet I'm telling them that they've got 20% of their kidney function. Then I give them blood pressure tablets and various other things, and they say, I feel worse because of your treatment. Um, but uh, there's always that uh, view that you should get um, improved at the same rate as you get worse. So if your blood pressure is terribly high and we reduce you down to being normal overnight, you'll feel dreadful because it's been coming on over time. If your blood pressure is normal and all of a sudden it's really high, you'll feel dreadful. And if we bring it back to normal very quickly, you'll feel better. So people are always saying, I've got an allergy to that blood pressure tablet. I felt terrible. It's not because of the tablet often. It's because you've had your blood pressure lowered. So. High blood pressure is a sign of kidney disease, but people don't often have any symptoms with high blood pressure. Um, passing urine at night is, as I say, one of the things that we will ask about. Doesn't always mean kidney problems, can mean any other number of things, but we check it out. Changes in the appearance of urine, I know it's written there, but it doesn't usually mean much unless it's reflecting uh, blood in the urine, or sometimes if it becomes very frothy, it can mean protein in the urine. But people will come in and say, my urine's dark. Generally, that's because of how much you've been drinking and how dilute your urine is or what, um, what foods you've been eating. Often people will come in with bright orange urine. It's because they've been taking vitamin tablets, not because they've got a kidney problem. Puffiness in the legs, pain in the kidney area, uh, things that happen relatively late in kidney disease. Although sometimes if you're losing a lot of protein in the urine, it, people will come in and say, I've got puffiness in my legs, and that will be a, um, a, a clue for your doctor to put a dipsticks into the urine and see whether or not there's protein there. Tiredness, I can't tell you, I can't think of a person who comes into my office and doesn't say that they're tired. So tiredness can be any number of things, and although it happens with kidney disease, it happens with the flu, it happens with you know, a chest infection, it happens with um, almost everything so it's not very specific. All these things on this side of the, the right-hand side of the slide are things that happen very late in kidney disease. We don't really want to get to that stage because once you get to that stage, often you need to be thinking you need kidney replacement therapy or making a decision about whether or not that's the path you want to go down or whether or not you're making a decision not to go on to dialysis or have a kidney transplant. There's not much we can do when you've got symptoms from kidney disease on that right-hand side of the um, slide, except for replace what your kidneys normally do. So we'd prefer it if we saw people when you have minor symptoms, and by far and away the best thing is to have a blood test and a urine test to check on your kidney function, because then if there is any abnormality, we can put things in place to slow the progression of your kidney disease. And if you think about it, say you've got 90% of your kidney function, and you're declining at 3% per year, in 30 years you're gonna have no kidney function. Now that's very important if you're only 20 at the time, but if you slow it down and you only um, halve that to say 1% per year, then you've got 
probably you know 45 years of kidney function. So a very small um, change in your um, your deterioration in kidney function by one one and a half percent will mean you've got a lot of extra years of good kidney function at the end, and that's what we try and do. Unfortunately, when you see a kidney doctor, um, you're almost stuck with them for life. So you know I. I talk to people about who've got kidney transplants and they're almost like my best statement. I need to see them every three months forever. So, um, and I get to know their families and you know what their jobs are doing and we become good friends over a, a long period of time, which is lovely, but it has to work for both parties that you know the person who you're looking after has, have to has, has to have confidence that you know you, you've got their best interests at heart, etc. So, these are just some facts. Um, so, you know, you can have um, uh, the diagnosis of kidney disease last more than three months. People will have an acute deterioration in kidney function. It'll get better. Um, we often see that in people who have an operation in a hospital and their kidney function will decline. It'll come good again. Um, but you can lose up to 90% of your kidney function and not realise it. And in fact, um, next week is uh, a, a Kidney Health Australia Week. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on next week and hopefully our Minister for Health is going to announce a very important um, initiative that's going to be helpful to, for patients next week. She'd be very uncomfortable if I mentioned it and stole her limelight. Um, but, uh, but next week um, is a whole week's focus, so hopefully you see a lot of you know, advocacy, etc., about kidney disease. Last year, one of the people who was very... Um, forthcoming in talking about kidney disease was a guy who was about to get married and he went on his bucks night and I think he drank too much alcohol and ended up in one of our um, emergency departments, had a blood test and found he only had 30% of his kidney function. Um, now he would never have known that had he not bumped his head and turned up and had a blood test um, through serendipity and then he was now being worked up you know for a wedding as well as being worked up for a um, uh, for a kidney transplant and his mum was going to donate in the kidney. So, um, you know, people need to realise that you can lose a lot of your kidney function before you, you end up any problem with a problem. But once you do, oh, sorry, you need to um, uh, go down the path of deciding whether renal replacement therapy is for you. Now, a lot of people think um, they have renal replacement therapy, everything comes back to normal. Well, it doesn't. Um, it only replaces what your kidneys do. So it won't improve your heart failure, for instance. It won't improve all of your symptoms of tiredness. It's, um, it's a big deal to go down renal replacement therapy. Transplantation, um, you almost come back to normal, but you don't completely, and people need to be on drugs forever. And um, the data would suggest that if you've got background cardiac disease and you're over the age of 75, then you don't actually almost get a survival advantage on average if you go down the dialysis route. So people need to have that discussion. People think, well, I must have dialysis because I, you know, I, I can't not, otherwise I might not survive. Well, there's not for everybody a considerable survival advantage. So different people, it won't actually improve your survival and it doesn't always improve your quality of life. So it is a difficult decision and that's a very individualised decision. Some people will benefit enormously, um, but if you're over the age of 75, the data's a little bit more, um, you know, I suppose mixed. So you need to have that discussion. And of course, people don't realise, but it, it causes a lot of morbidity and it causes a lot of mortality in our community. So in summary, there's, it's common. Um, about one in 10 adults have a sign of kidney disease. It's harmful, causes a lot of death, but the good news is it's manageable, particularly if detected early. Now, this is just some statistics about our um, dialysis uh, population, and this is ANS data. This is the Australian and New Zealand Dialysis and Transplant Registry, and this looks at the numbers of people since the 1960s who've been put onto dialysis in Australia and New Zealand, with Australia being in the blue line. And you can see it pretty much keeps on going up and up and up. Now the reasons why people go on to dialysis are diabetes. Um, so diabetes accounts for about 45% of people who end up with kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. And 
it should be entirely preventable if people look after their diabetes from very early on. But again, diabetes is one of those fairly silent diseases and people don't realise that in the background diabetes is causing them problems with their kidney function and with their blood vessels, etc. You can see the other forms of kidney disease are actually declining. Um, so diabetes and high blood pressure are the things that we mostly worry about. They account for about 60, 65% of people on dialysis or who have transplants and they are entirely preventable. What I'd like to do is put myself out of a job, um, but it's very hard to get people to appropriately um, uh, recognise that they've got a problem and what they need to do about it. So this is the estimated burden of diabetes in 2003. And you can see here what they, est what in 2003, there were 194 million people worldwide. This is the International Diabetes Federation. And they made an assumption that, um, or a projection based on the rate of increase of diabetes at that stage, that there would be 333 million people um, with diabetes by 2025. If we then look at last year's um, estimates from the IDF, instead of 333, 10 years later, we've ended up with 415 million, so a third more than what we actually expected. And the estimates now are that by 2040, there's going to be 642 million people with diabetes. So if there's more people with diabetes, there's more people with kidney disease, and that puts an enormous um, individual uh, burden, um, but also family burden, society burden, etc., and not to mention economic um, uh, stress on our, um, on our healthcare systems. So this here is, uh, you know, I think people realise about diabetes. They, they seem to have gotten the, 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 the hint that you need to check on what your diabetes is like. But in fact, when you look at it, these are, uh, and, and I won't really go through the whole thing, but it's people without diabetes, without kidney disease, people with diabetes but no kidney disease, people with kidney disease and no diabetes, and people with the two. Now, uniformly across this is heart failure, heart attack, stroke, um, circulation problems, uh, cardiac rhythm problems and death. By far and away, if you've got kidney disease and diabetes, you're much more likely to have one of those vascular events or die. But in fact, although people recognise there's a problem with diabetes, if you've, this is the diabetes in the orange, uniformly, if you've got kidney disease and no diabetes, you're worse than if you've got just diabetes. So. People need to worry more about having chronic kidney disease. They worry about their cholesterol, potentially their blood pressure, potentially their diabetes, but they don't worry enough about their kidney disease. So people need to worry more about kidney disease and, you know, because we can do things about it. So about half of the people, um, oh sorry, um, about half of the people who have diabetes realise that they've got diabetes, about half of the people don't know they've got diabetes. But for chronic kidney disease, only about 10% of people who have kidney disease recognise they've got kidney disease. So it's very silent and it's a huge sleeper um, for us. So we, we want people to get checked and so we can't get everybody checked. We went through a phase where we said, oh, you're over 50 um, and everybody who came into hospital, we sent them a letter saying you're at risk of kidney disease and that created the most enormous worry for everybody in the community. I it seemed to see every doctor's parent in North Shore. Um, but So we've sort of had to tailor the people who are at most risk. So people who have high blood pressure, people who are obese, because people who are obese tend to have those um, that pattern of cholesterol problems, high blood pressure, diabetes and kidney disease, and people who smoke. Smoking is the worst thing you can do for your kidneys. Um, so if I see young people, then I say to them, um, don't do drugs because drugs will cause constriction of blood vessels and cause kidneys to be a problem. Don't do cigarettes. And if you have to pick a vice, then limited amounts of alcohol is probably better for your kidneys than anything. Now, I'm not telling people to drink alcohol, but if you have to sort of um, you know, say to a young person, you can't do anything, they'll say, well, bugger it, I won't do, you know, I won't take any notice of you. But in terms of cocaine is the, the commonest cause of acute kidney failure in young people, um, but cigarettes and, um, and uh, you know, other sort of 
smoking related drugs are very damaging. Whereas alcohol causes high blood pressure, etc. But from a kidney perspective, it's not quite so damaging. Different for liver, different for other um, health issues, but from a kidney perspective. So people who are of Aboriginal or Tor Torres Strait Islanders have about 100 times the risk of kidney disease that the what Caucasian people do um, and at a younger age. So that's multifactorial and it probably is due to something called epigenetics where the environment changes not your gene sequences but the way those gene sequences are read um, and therefore the proteins that the genes encode for. Um, so it's evolved so that um, people who are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background have an increased risk of kidney disease. If you've got acute kidney injury, all the time you have a little um, injury to the kidney, it heals, but it doesn't heal back to the way it started. So multiple acute kidney injuries almost you know, predispose people to more rapidly declining kidney function. Heart disease we've spoken about, cardiorenal syndrome, anybody with a heart problem, vascular problem is at risk of kidney disease, people with kidney disease um, predispose, uh, are predisposed to heart problems. And if you've got a family history of kidney disease, and even if you didn't inherit the kidney disease, if you get another form of blood pressure, vascular disease, your family history of kidney disease also impacts on giving you a heightened risk of developing kidney problems down the track. So we suggest people have a urine test, simple test with your doctor, but often they'll send it off so that, because the dipsticks tests don't always pick up microscopic amounts of protein. A blood test gives us a very accurate assessment of what your kidney function is in a percentage term and have your blood pressure checked. And if all of those are normal, your chances of having kidney disease are very small. If they're not normal, it doesn't mean that you've got kidney disease, but it means you need to be looked out for it and you need to manage those risks so that you don't end up with kidney problems. Um, so um, I think I've already said that, so I'll move on. So if your kidneys do fail, then dialysis or transplant's really the only way to go. And there are two forms of dialysis and probably um, it's not much point in talking much about them unless you want to later on. But there's one form where you can see here, um, we join up an artery and a vein in the arm and we put a needle into both of those, the artery and into the vein. So we take the blood out of the artery and put it through a machine and the machine filters the blood and we take it back into the vein. Now that's done at least three times a week. Some people will do it each day. The more dialysis you do, the more it reflects your normal kidney function, but there's obviously a tipping point where you can't dialyze all day, every day. Um, but mostly people who do more dialysis feel better for it. Mostly we prefer people to dialyze at home. Um, so if people have the wherewithal, we try and say, train people so that they have autonomy over their um, kidney disease. And, you know, everybody says, I'd never be able to put a needle in, but everybody can. Everybody says they wouldn't be able to use insulin, but they can. Um, and so we try and make people feel secure that there won't be a problem doing that. And the government subsidises um, water, electricity, all of that sort of thing. The, the expense that people are up for mostly is a chair. Um, but that means that you're not stuck with the hospital situation where they say you've got to be here at two o'clock and you know, you've know you got to come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, etc. It gives people a bit of flexibility to think, well, I'd rather you know, do that a bit earlier so I can go out for lunch or um, you know, etc. It just gives people a bit of autonomy over their lives. Peritoneal dialysis is something that there's a tube put into the abdomen, we run fluid in, and then the toxins in the system swap into the fluid and we run the fluid out. Now, most of the time that's done overnight, um, so people just hook themselves up to a little sort of cartridge type thing by the bed and that happens overnight. People disconnect in the morning and off they go during the day. So there's different reasons why people would pick one or the other form of dialysis. Kids, for instance, peritoneal dialysis is good. They go to school, they do all the usual stuff. Um, sometimes uh, people don't like to do something every day. Lifestyle, you know, I had a judge who was on dialysis and he preferred hemodialysis because he was stuck, <coughs> stuck in a chair and he used to do his judgments while he was in the chair. So he'd get all of his work done while he was on dialysis. And similarly, I had a person who was very, who did fabulously in her medical course because she was on dialysis, completed her medical degree, 
had a transplant from her mum and now is sort of a, a, a very um, eminent anaesthetist. So uh, transplantation, we like transplants because transplants just puts you back to being completely normal but you need to be followed up every so often. There are problems with transplants that they don't, you know, you have to make sure that they're um, compatible, that you're not going to reject the transplants. Um, and because of the immunosuppression, you're a bit susceptible to infection. And because um, normally your, your immune system has a surveillance mechanism to stop you from getting cancer, um, it, it, people are more susceptible to cancer. Now, they might be more susceptible to cancer, but less people die of cancer when they've had a transplant because you're stuck seeing doctors forever, so they pick it up. And the increased susceptibility might mean that the normal population might have a risk of, say, 2 in 10,000. Um, people with transplants might have 4 in 10,000. So it's twice the risk, but the, you know, the real risk is 9,998 people don't get it if you don't have a transplant, 9,996 don't get it if you do have a transplant. So you've got to sort of figure out how you put those sort of um, bits of information in perspective. And then, of course, there's this um, uh, people that opt not to have a kidney tr uh, transplant or go into dialysis, um, and s there are some reasons why neither of those might be suitable for anybody. Um, and I think maybe Hannah's going to talk a bit about supportive care. There's a lot that we can do for people who decide not to have dialysis to make their, um, you know, their their lives, etc., and quality of life much better. So um, why should you keep your kidneys healthy? Well, for all the obvious reasons, you don't want your kidneys to fail. Um, uh, and then because there's also this link between cardiovascular disease and we don't want people who have kidney problems to end up with an excess of cardiovascular disease. Um, and there's a whole lot of reasons why they might be linked that you know we can go into if there's any, um, uh, any questions about it down the track. So basically you need to make sure that all of the things that you know about from your cardiovascular risk, um, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, exercise, your diet, etc., that they're all fabulous. But then there's also things that we can do as nephrologists to make sure that things like your calcium, your potassium, um, your protein in your urine, etc., are all um, back into the normal range because that all improves your kidney function and the uh, and the consequences of having impaired kidney function. So I think, you know, early detection, take responsibility and, you know, try and be focused. I think, you know, young people with any sort of chronic um, health problem often lose focus and so I think we need to try and support particularly young people to make sure that they're, they're fine. Now, I just put this in because um, this is what the research that my own lab does to try and improve the um, the uh, really the lives of people with kidney disease. So it's really based around trying to slow down the um, uh, the progression of kidney disease and to um, really develop novel therapies in partnership with some um, small biotechs and, and pharma. We also know that people, for instance, with diabetes don't always develop kidney disease. So why do some people develop it and other people don't? So we're trying to tease out some of those mechanisms that um, you know, we can say, well, you're likely to develop it because you have this particular characteristic, and then we want to try and modify that characteristic or put more, if not effort, we put effort into everybody, but um, more focus on, you know, how we might slow that particular person's kidney problems. So I think there's also the issue about donation, um, because, I, I, and it's both living donation and cadaveric donation, and I think people are worried about donating kidneys. People who donate a kidney to um, a living um, person actually live longer than people who don't donate kidneys. Now, it's not because they've donated a kidney. It's because you never are allowed to donate a kidney unless you have super fabulous health. So if there's anything wrong with somebody, you don't get to the donation perspective. And I think there's a lot of people who are on, who are on dialysis who would say, if they could get five years, even if it's not a great kidney, and certainly I've had people on with kidney transplants for 40 years and more now, and we haven't really been doing them for much longer than about 50 years. Um, but you know, there are critical times in people's lives when I ring up somebody in the middle of the night and I say, "You're being offered a kidney. It's not a you know a fabulous kidney," but they'll say, "Look, I've got a 12-year-old 
I'd really like to get them through the end of their schooling. If I have a kidney, it gets me off dialysis for five or six years, will that happen? And then they're happy to do that and then go down the path of considering a second transplant. So, you know, I think everybody needs to be involved in their own decisions and doctors shouldn't be making decisions for people. Um, it has to be, you know, a, a joint decision process. Better to do that in the light of the day rather than when I ring you up at two in the morning um, because uh, it, it's, it's best to do those things proactively. So I'm um, putting in a plug for what Daniel did. I think there's a lot of good information on um, the Kidney Health uh, website. And I think too there's a lot of um, uh, collegiality. So I think a lot of people think, you know, can I talk to somebody who's been through this, somebody who's had a transplant, somebody who's on dialysis, this sort of dialysis or that sort of dialysis. And I think sometimes people think, oh, they, that unit might be just wheeling me out the people who've had a very positive experience opposed to, you know, what, is, what has generally happened. And I think um, Kidney Health Australia is very good from their community resources, so they'll be able to provide you with information and um, people to talk to so that you sort of feel more confident and less lonely in terms of um, having a, a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. So I think I'll um, finish there and, uh, and I'll hand it over to, I think Stephanie is next, isn't she? So, and then I think we're having a discussion at the end, so we'll take questions at the end. That's what I'm supposed to say. Isn't it? Uh, thanks very much, Professor Pollock. Our next uh, speaker is Stephanie Nataris, who's an accredited practicing dietitian in specialising in kidney disease. She's completed a master in social health and counselling, is a guest lecturer at University of Wollongong, and she's going to talk about I have kidney disease, what do I eat? Let's welcome Stephanie. Thank you. everyone, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, so I will be speaking about what you can eat while you have kidney disease. And the aim of my talk today is to understand how certain eating behaviours um, can improve your health and quality of life once you've been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. So as um, it's sort of been spoken about tonight, kidney disease is a very silent disease and there's not as much awareness about the kidneys and the role of nutrition with this disease as what there might be with things like diabetes and heart disease. So when people do get diagnosed, they're very surprised that there is quite a big role um, for nutrition in their management. So nutrition's part of the therapy of all stages of chronic kidney disease but it does differ between all of the stages. And there's five stages, all the way from one, which is right at the beginning, to four and five, which are the more advanced um, stages of kidney disease. And people's needs do change. So if you are seeing someone, a dietitian that is giving you advice and you find that they are telling you a few different things every time you see them, they're not changing their minds, they're just adapting to what is going on for you and your health at the time. Um, as uh, Professor Pollock already alluded to, the causes of kidney disease, well, the, the biggest causes are really lifestyle related. It's diabetes and it's high blood pressure. And of course, we would think that the therapy for trying to actually control some of those, um, those factors, so diabetes and high blood pressure, would also be lifestyle related. And the main aim of any type of um, nutrition therapy, especially if you're able to start as early as possible, is to really preserve kidney function and improve quality of life because you can imagine once you get to the later stages and dialysis is needed or going down a renal supportive care pathway, it's really more symptom control versus trying to protect kidney function. So, um, so these are the steps. So there's five stages of chronic kidney disease. And um, there's also more information on the Kidney Health Australia website that will be a lot more detailed than this. But I just wanted to illustrate how in the first few stages, it's really more about managing those other diseases that would be making the kidneys worse. So the high blood pressure, managing blood sugar levels, moderating protein intake, which is something that not a lot of people are aware of, and I'll explain the reasons a little bit later. But it all comes down to general healthy eating guidelines. And, um, 
and it's all about trying to preserve kidney function. So there is a scope to try and protect kidney function in the earlier stages. Once we get into the later stages, it becomes very, very difficult to use nutrition as any type of treatment. It's more about symptom control, not making things worse and trying to um, you know, prevent yourself from becoming malnourished because you can feel quite unwell to eat. So as you can see in the later stages, it becomes very tricky and very complex. But in the earlier stages, it can be a little bit easier to get on top of it. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is some of the experiences of people living with chronic kidney disease and their eating behaviours. And this is from research that's available where they've interviewed people with um, kidney disease, both internationally and here in Sydney. So a lot of the time people are very confused with what to do. They're not sure about how to manage things. They feel very limited with their food choices and I'll explain why um, in a little bit because you know, with any change you might be used to doing the same thing for 30 or 40 years and then someone tells you to change. So it's always a little bit difficult. You can have um, feelings of being quite overwhelmed, um, hard to change. And the most important one is really people don't feel like they've got chronic kidney disease. So if I don't feel sick, what's the point of changing? And if I'm going to change and I'm still going to feel the same, but only a number is going to change, what's the point? And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on about how to actually deal with having to make eating behaviour changes when you're dealing with a silent disease. Because what, if you wait to actually feel sick, to be motivated to make changes, unfortunately, it's just too late. Um, but if, you're, if you sort of start a little bit earlier, it'll be much better. And um, with a bit of research that I've done in my unit, all of the people that I've interviewed have mentioned that the only real reason they'd want to change their eating behaviours is to avoid dialysis. That is probably the biggest, bur excuse me, the biggest burden that people um, deal with with kidney disease. So what can you do? So what I'm going to do is talk more about the earlier stages because stages four and five are very complex and it's outside the scope of a group, of a group talk. So getting on top of the factors that actually increase the risk of chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. So diabetes, blood pressure and obesity, which have also been mentioned already. So that would be in combination with all of the medical treatments that your nephrologist and GP would be recommending. But nutrition plays a very, very big role with all of these things. So the first one would be having regular meals. Now, as simple as it sounds, it can be very hard for people's lifestyles. And from what the research that we do know, regular meals means better appetite control, means you don't overdo it at one meal time. You try and spread them out over the whole day. Keep them as balanced as possible. So a big mixture of fruits, vegetables, dairy foods, nuts, um, and your protein foods. So meat, poultry, and, um, and fish. So if things are balanced like that and you're getting a really good variety and you're eating at least three times a day, you're already on the right track. Um, the benefit is better blood sugar control and better appetite control. Now, what I've got here, I don't know, who's seen the healthy plate model before? Has anyone seen it? Yes. So pretty much what we recommend, which I know can be very hard to do, is for when you're looking at your plate, half of the plate to be full of vegetables, a quarter of the plate to be full of your protein, which would be your meat, chicken, fish, um, eggs, and then a quarter of your plate to be full of carbohydrates, which are things like rice, pasta, potatoes, um, or a couple of slices of bread. So even if that is the only aim, that's what you're aiming for, you're, you're actually on the right track to better control. But of course, it's very difficult for, for a lot of people. Um, another thing that's actually really important is to reduce salt. And um, as it's already been mentioned before, salt does raise blood pressure. So lowering salt intake from the diet will help to lower blood pressure. Lower blood pressure means that you've got less pressure on the kidneys. Um, now, you might be surprised, but a lot of the salt that does come through is actually through packaged and processed foods. So about 80 to 85% of all the salt that we have is through anything that is in a packet. So by eating as fresh as possible, you've probably already eliminated a massive salt load um, in your diet. So more fresh food, less packaged foods. The other thing, of course, is table salt, which in, is so um, common in many cultures. 
and less salt and more herbs and spices. So all the herbs and spices are quite safe, um, you know, with, with diabetes, with high blood pressure, with kidney disease, and it actually takes a good four weeks to get used to eating less salt. So even for the first week or so as you're trying to do this, you might actually not really enjoy your food until you actually get used to it. So over flavoring it with things like herbs and spices can be quite helpful until your palate adapts. Um, in my practice, when I do see people, if they're eating a lot of salt, it might be very difficult to cut, cut it back completely. So even making small changes where you cut out a quarter of your salt for one week, half of your salt the next week or over a month. And you can slowly do that um, to work towards trying to get a lower salt intake. The benefits a lower blood pressure and of course slowing down the decline in kidney function. So adequate protein. Now protein is something that um, has been I guess investigated a lot and there's a lot out there about um, high protein diets and how they help with um, weight loss etc. But once you have kidney disease a high protein load is actually not helpful. So what we actually recommend is just getting enough for what your body needs, not too high. And for most people, that's probably if, let's say, an average diet might be a little bit of cereal for breakfast, um, maybe a sandwich for lunch, and uh, or a, a hot meal at lunch with some, you know, a roast or some vegetables, and then you have a light dinner. If the meat portion or the chicken or fish portion is about the size of your palm and the thickness of maybe a matchbox, then that's probably enough. And unless you've got other conditions where you actually need the higher protein, which you would have been advised that by your dietitian or your doctors. Um, but for most people, we don't need more than that because you would be getting protein, not just from the meat, but also from the protein foods, a little bit from your bread, um, from any, if you're having any whole grain products, um, and of course things like nuts and, and, and those types of things. So the Australians typical, typically eat a lot more than what they need. Um, so even cutting back to maybe just a palm size or a quarter of, of the plate will actually be quite helpful. Um, the benefits of reducing protein is that what they found in the research is that it can reduce deaths from renal disease by about 30% um, without cause. And we don't really recommend low protein diets, we just recommend moderate protein diets, which is sort of what I've outlined um, before. And it can preserve kidney function and it can delay the need for dialysis. The research is not that conclusive about how long it can delay the need for dialysis, but when you're getting towards the later stages of kidney disease and you feel quite unwell, the and you, if, you're, if you're eating a lot of protein, that can actually increase the toxins in the blood. So by having normal amounts of protein, it can actually be quite helpful. So I um, want to spend a little bit of time on this because it's all well and good for me to say, reduce your salt, reduce your protein. But you've really got to think to yourself, what is the point? What is the purpose? of actually making these changes. And because it is a silent disease, you don't always feel that urgency. Like let's say if you've got, um, you know, you've got pain, you wanna fix that pain. You don't really feel very much at that time. So you've really gotta find that internal motivation of why it would be a good idea. So I always ask my patients to, to ask themselves, where do I wanna see myself in a year or two years or five years? And what's really important to you? Is it independence? Is it being able to pick up your grandkids from school? Is it to be able to do some gardening, to be able to go and, ha and um, spend time with your friends and your family? Because those things are impacted, unfortunately, when you get to the, the later stages of kidney disease. So when you do start to lose motivation and you just wanna go back to normal eating habits, those are the things that you've really gotta have at the back of your mind. Why is this all important? Um, and I guess, Eating is within your control, and even small changes will make a difference. Um, so think about what's in it for you, and find your internal motivation, and of course try and enjoy your food as much as possible. So it's not about being overly restrictive, it's about just making small changes and eating as fresh as possible. Um, 
So I guess for more information, you can see an accredited practicing dietitian. Everyone is qualified to deal with chronic kidney disease. Um, and of course, if it's the later stages, you're probably more likely to see a dietitian in a hospital. Um, but also the Kidney Health Australia website does have um, some uh, really good resources out there as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, obviously, for our three speakers. I'm going to ask them, please, to come to our panel seats here, give you a chance to ask some questions. I, I did forget to introduce myself. I'm Dr Alan Shell. I've been involved with the hospital for over 35 years. I'm on the Board of Management and Board of Director and a Director of the Board. Uh, I just want to remind you that we've handed out the Move Well program. Um, I'm an undercover boss. I've had a hip replacement and a knee replacement being to our rehab program. And for those of us who, I guess, uh, want to move well, we have a Move Well program. You've had a look at that. Please consider us if you sort of fit the bill here. We'd love to help you. Okay, so this evening we have excellent speakers. We've had a number of issues raised, uh, from donation to asking the questions about what, how am I going to feel, what's going to happen. So I guess it's over to you. Ruth has got a microphone. She'll go around and people raise their hands and we'll ask some questions of the uh, panel. Anybody on this side? No question? Yes, gentlemen up here. Stephanie spoke a lot about um, diet when you always have renal disease. Could you speak about avoiding diet to avoid? To avoid renal disease? So that would be more about trying to manage um, some of the conditions that are quite common that would lead to renal disease. So, for example, managing diabetes and managing high blood pressure, even in the absence of chronic kidney disease, would help to try and reduce the risk of getting it. And it's actually quite interesting that the treatment for it from a nutrition perspective is actually also the prevention. So it's still about moderation, it's about low salt, um, and having a really balanced it's really it's all around the, health, the Australian um, healthy eating guidelines. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I've been doing various uh, lectures about uh, health and, and various um, uh, other lectures other than at Walter lectures. And I was just thinking tonight, the kidneys actually filter the uh, fluids out of the body. Nobody mentioned how much fluid you should drink every day. And also, uh, I've turned vegetarian. Nobody mentioned being a vegetarian. I do have boiled fish. That's the only change. And I've changed my whole diet. And I've lost about, I don't know, almost 10 kilos in weight. But nobody mentioned uh, being vegetarian, nobody mentioned how much water a day you're supposed to drink. And the last question is, can you get cancer of the kidney? Yeah. Professor Pollock. Um, yeah, all good questions. Um, in terms of how much fluid you should drink, if your kidney function is um, perfect, then it, your kidneys will sort out um, to keep fluid if you're dehydrated and to get rid of extra fluid if you've drunk more fluid. If your kidneys are impaired, then it really is a, um, a, a, a need to look at what type of kidney disease you have and whether or not you're somebody who needs to restrict fluid or you need to drink more fluid. Now that depends on the type of kidney disease that you have because there are some kidney diseases that mean that you pass too much urine, then you need to drink more fluid. So the mistake people make is they get up at night to pass urine, so they think that they shouldn't drink because then that will make them get up at night. Now they'll probably still get up at night and all that not drinking will do is to make you dehydrated. If everything else is equal, the optimal amount that your kidneys need to either stop the kidney from concentrating the urine or alternatively to dilute the urine is about one and a half litres a day. So there is this theory that maybe if you drink more fluid you'll flush your kidneys. 
that isn't really borne out by any science and some people will retain too much fluid. At different times of kidney disease as well, we'll be saying to people, um, for instance, if they're recovering from acute kidney disease, then they'll be not able to reabsorb as much fluid as they should. So we'll be saying you need to drink more fluid. Other people will be saying, look, you've got fluid retention, you need to restrict your fluid. So um, the best way to decide if you need to, if your weight's stable, um, it means that probably your fluid intake is appropriate. So it is slightly different once you get to end stage kidney disease, but if your kidney function is more than about 30%, about one and a half litres a day on average, unless there's a, a specific reason not to. Now as far as vegetarianism goes, most people, and you know, I'd be interested in Stephanie's comments, most people will need some protein. Um, and whether or not you get protein from animal sources or from um, plant sources um, is, uh, you know, different. Obviously, around the world, there's people that um, have different sources of protein. And animal protein is probably um, not the best form of protein for kidney disease. Um, and there are reasons why people might be, um, you know, more or less aligned to a vegetarian diet or, um, a, you know, a non-vegetarian diet. From a kidney perspective, it probably doesn't make much difference provided there's not too much protein um, uh, in your diet. So with, we used to restrict people's protein intake quite severely, but now when we use drugs that stop the kidney from filtering too much, that um, enthusiasm for really restricting to very low protein diets has sort of, um, you know, has been something of the past. And as Stephanie said, a lot of the time, if you change the diet too radically, people get used to that sort of a diet and then they won't be able to adapt to a diet that might be more appropriate for dialysis or transplant. So does that answer your question? About kidney cancer. Oh, kidney cancer. Look, kidney cancer um, is actually on the increase. We don't know whether or not that's because of um, toxins or uh, environmental influences. Uh, or whether because people are more likely to have an ultrasound or a CT than what they would used to have and so we diagnose it more. Kidney cancer used to be um, un untreatable but just in the last probably five years or so there's been a lot of new drugs for kidney cancer. People who have kidney failure I have a slightly increased risk of kidney um, cancer but it's not a particularly big increase and having um, a transplant doesn't increase risk of cancer in your own kidneys. So things like smoking um, is a significant risk for kidney cancer, asbestos exposure, um, and there are some other toxins, but most of the time we really don't know. Oh, there's some family cancers as well that kidney um, can be associated with, but most of the time we don't know why people get kidney cancer. Same as a lot of cancers, we really don't know what initiates it but there's a lot better treatment for it these days and again there's there's trials on the kidney um, health australia website so if people have kidney cancer they can look it up and see that people are um, looking at new treatments new options etc and if you have kidney cancer and you need to have a kidney out then having one kidney is perfectly okay provided that kidney is normal thank you Okay, one, one question I have is that uh, looking at some of the information from the website, uh, we have a waiting list of about a thousand people waiting for a healthy kidney transplant, Is it, and people I guess are talking more about organ transplant. When you talk about having a not such a good kidney being offered, does that mean we in our 60s aren't good sort of donor potential people, or I mean how do you assess people's quality of donating a kidney? Yeah, uh, uh, so if, it, if you're a, um, a living donor, then uh, it very much is um, an assessment by an independent nephrologist. So if I was looking after somebody, I wouldn't be looking after their donor as well. That wouldn't be an ethical relationship. So there would be somebody else who'd be looking after the donor. And pretty much if there's any other reason that they might develop kidney problems into the future. So we wouldn't usually take somebody who had diabetes or kidney impairment at, at, at any stage or even if they've got vascular disease or some other problem that could affect the kidney as well. So we do an enormous amount of tests and then if you get through all those tests, you become a, a donor. The, the, the issue about um, 
would you accept a donor is more the cadaveric donor. Yes. So there's a lot of people who say, look, um, you know, once I go, you can have anything. And so they say to their family, just put me up for being a donor. Or so they're on a donation list because you now can... On a donation list, yeah. yeah. So that means that there's things like, they, there's a lot of things that people can donate. Um, and one of them is their kidneys, but they can donate their corneas yeah. and various other things. So things like corneas mostly don't deteriorate with age, but kidneys do deteriorate with age. So um, I, for instance, I think, uh, when was it, Monday night, got offered a kidney for, from an 80-year-old donor into a 46-year-old recipient. Now that kidney is, you know, 34 years older than the recipient. The donor had mild diabetes and high blood pressure and um, had had a previous heart attack. Now that kidney was probably going to be affected by um, problems with the kidney blood vessels. So would that be a reasonable kidney to put into a 46 year old? Wow. So I'd be thinking maybe you want a kidney that's a bit more age matched and something that's, um, uh, you know, that's that, that, that going to last longer. But, you know, my approach is I ring up the patient and I say, look, there's a kidney that's been offered. Uh, what do you think? And, um, and then I explain the reasons why the kidney might last longer or not so long. Now some people go in perfectly well on dialysis and they say, look, you know, I've been offered a kidney, that means I'm at the top of the list if you like, so maybe I'm better off waiting for a bit longer. Other people will say, look, I'm really struggling, I really would like at this stage of my life to have, you know, I might say that kidney you might get five years, ten years, but you're not going to get 40 years out of that kidney. Um, other people will say, I'd rather wait for a kidney, I'm going to get 40 years. So, so it's a tough decision when we donate or hope to donate our kidney, if something happens or have it on our, we're on the list and if we have an accident obviously younger is a better kidney. So it's sad that while we are having people waiting, not all kidneys are going to be relevant for that person waiting on the list. No, and I guess for Hannah... If it was offered for somebody um, to so who was 80, yeah. then we do what's called dual kidneys okay. as well. So instead of just transplanting um, one kidney into one person, okay. um, which benefits two people, if the kid, if we do what, um, if it's a, what's called a marginal donor, we might give one person two kidneys, and overall that gives them more kidney mass and yeah. it functions better. We also do kidney biopsies um, on occasion to look at the kidney structure to say, look, it, it actually is actually pretty good. So that gives us a bit more um, decision making. So there's um, there's that aspect. Then there's also the the immune responses. So we might say, look, you match perfectly well on on this kidney. So this kidney is likely to work. Or we might say, you only match on you know 50% or less of the um, of, you know the way we match organs. So it might not work quite so well. Or you might need to have more um, you know drugs to keep the kidney going. And all of those things are uh, are things that we take into account. Okay. There's a, there's a, it's quite complex, but... Yep. A couple more questions over here, yep. This is a question for you, please. You keep referring to older people, the older <laughs> people can be expected to be less. Is there... Can you relate figures to that? In other words, a 70-year-old person against a 50-year-old person, you would expect the 70-year-old person's kidney function to be than a I, I just can't see who's talking. Oh, gentlemen over here inside. Oh, I've got this light yeah. that's sort of stuck Sorry. right in my eye. Um, yeah, so um, the, the idea is if somebody is perfectly well, then um, there's a, um, a distribution of normal that goes in that bell distribution. So normal can be somewhere between, say, 80 and 120%, um, with the majority of people being at 100%. Now, um, from the age of about 40, you lose, just in terms of age-related decline in kidney function, about 10% per decade. So if you're 40 and you've got 100%, then by the time you get to 80, um, you'll... It, 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 sorry, if you're 40 and you've got 100%, by the time you get to 80, normally you would only have 60% of your kidney function. That would be perfectly normal for an 80-year-old. 
If you started off and you were on that lower end of that bell distribution and you started off at 80, by the 80 percent of normal, by the time you got to 80 years of age, you would only have 40 percent of your kidney function, and that could still be normal. So the things that we look at are: uh, is the kidney function deteriorating, or is it impaired but stable, or do you have protein in your urine? Because if you've got impaired kidney function but it's stable and no protein in your urine, you're very unlikely to have progressive kidney failure. It is probably going to be impaired but stable over time. So that would be a situation where we wouldn't really be so concerned about following somebody up quite as much. Whereas if you've gone from 60 to 40 over the space of a year or so, we'd be thinking this is worrying. And if you've got more than a gram, even more so if you've got more than three grams of protein in your urine, that would be a predictor that that would be something that we would you know, have to worry that people are going to have a rapid decline in kidney function and need renal replacement therapy or not. Thank you. But one more last question here in the front. Uh, why the non-compatible donations not publicised more, seeing there's such a shortage of kidney? Um, so there's different forms of non-compatible donations. So there's what's we used to only ever do transplants when people had the same blood group, um, whereas uh, it, it was all, almost a serendipitous finding that if you didn't have the same blood group, they could still work. Um, the, um, it, it, there's, you, you have to assess to see whether or not the recipient might have an antibody against the blood group. And if they do have an antibody against the blood group, then um, again, we know it wouldn't work, so we wouldn't accept it. So not all incompatible donations are acceptable, but some are. It's more likely that we get an incompatible donation where there's an um, immune response uh, when we test the kidney to see. So we put the person, the donor cells and the recipient serum and vice versa. And if there's a reaction in the test tube, we know that kidney will never work. So there's no point in going down and doing the transplant. So then there's the paired kidney exchange program. So it might be that you, you have a partner who's a willing a donor, but we know it just won't work in your particular circumstances. And there might be another partner who's in the same, another couple in the same boat. So there's a thing called the kidney, um, the paired kidney exchange, whereby my kidney might work in that person and their donor might work in my couple. So that's called the paired kidney exchange and we do one of those runs about every every couple of months. And I don't know if you've seen, there was a, um, a story on the television where there was about a, a, an altruistic donor, which means somebody was going to donate to a friend who happened to get a kidney and he was already going to donate, so he donated to the pool and that set off a chain of this, I'll donate to you, you donate to that person, you donate to that and about eight people got trans transplanted as a result of that. There was a, a famous New York Times front cover where they had about 50 people who were donated because of that chain. So um, some, some, you know, we offer that to everybody as part of our education process, um, so people are aware that that can happen. All of those transplants have to happen simultaneously, and New Zealand participate in that program with us. And it actually has reduced the waiting list quite significantly. Um, so there's a whole lot of other things we do to try and improve things. We, we try and reduce um, uh, the antibodies for people that might be sensitised to transplantation and we do that through various mechanisms. But our ultimate aim is to try and get as many people who, to have kidney transplants as possible because it really does transform lives. So I think um, you know there's there's lots of different options that you need to discuss um, with both the transplant coordinators who are um, have a nursing background and your doctors. Now all nephrologists aren't transplanting physicians. Um, I happen to be a transplanting physician, but um, the it, some doctors will want you to go and see a transplant unit because they that might not be their um, specific expertise. And not all hospitals, my hospital for instance, doesn't do some of the more difficult um, uh, ABO incompatible, that blood group incompatible transplants. Um, 
So there may be a better place for those transplants to be done. Thank you. Okay, so a bit of pressure of time. I think that we really have had a very, very good presentation. Kidney awareness, kidney awareness week next week. That's why we offer you this evening on kidney awareness. We really have to thank our guests here, Professor Pollock, Stephanie and Hannah. And Hannah, I'm sorry we cut you off there, but again, the important thing there is to ask questions because there are lots of answers to the problem in this situation. And obviously it's a tough, a tough disease to have. Diet's very important and thank you very much for listening. We have the next meeting of the WAPA program uh, managing medications uh, on the 6th of July. So we certainly, if you're not on our list, please put yourself on the list out the front there. And I want to say thank you to our guest speakers. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming along. We hope to see you in July. Have a good evening.